I'm John Petrich, a longtime ham. Uh, know De uh, Derek from a long time ago and just met very recently. I'm going to present material which I think might be helpful for uh, new users of GNU Radio, some very practical uh, skills at using the flow graph. I know where I'm uh, with my work with other people locally, uh, getting them involved in GNU Radio and reflecting back on my early experience. I remember how it was confusing and intimidating. And uh, while the graphical programming in one level really isn't hard, it's just unfamiliar. And there are some uh, things to point out that uh, could maybe improve the learning curve. So with that, um, I'm gonna try this command and get on to my presentation. Well, using GNU radio to build radios, this is gonna emphasize uh, radio building and de-emphasize some of the other aspects of digital signal processing that are uh, possible through GNU radio. This is meant to be a kickstart and to help the, the new or novice user to use a full graph. Um, my name is John Petrich and there's my call letters. And um, this material is also presented on my website. There's a, a link for you to follow, should you wish. Although there's plenty of <laughs> resources here with uh, what Barry has done. The major topics of this presentation are getting started with GMC, GRC, basic flow graph workspace organization. And I'm kind of a stickler for this, and I'll explain why and how as this, we proceed. I'm gonna draw your attention to certain flow graph details which materially improve how things work and um, do some problem solving, data flow problem solving and uh, some practical odds and ends for real radials which include transmit and receive operation. And then maybe we'll leave some time here as we discussed earlier for a group uh, uh, discussion. Um, <clears throat> in trying to put things in one place, uh, some of you may have explored the GNU Radio Wiki. Maybe others haven't. How do you install GNU Radio? And this is the link right there. This is what Barry wrote. Uh, there's quite a bit of material in there and quite a few choices. So uh, if you haven't studied it, that's the place to start. It's, uh, in my opinion, the single best uh, approach. Um, here are two guided tutorials uh, links that I have found useful over the years. The first one is by Balance Sieber, who used to be uh, an employee at Edis Research. And it emphasizes not so much uh, the, the basic flow graph, but basic DSP. But sort of incidentally, as he was doing DSP little projects, you pick up on how to use the flow graph. I found these novice techniques very useful, um, maybe a, a bit outdated since he was using an old version of GNU radio, but nonetheless useful. And then finally, we have Barry's uh, list of tutorials. Uh, I'm calling it sophisticated and somewhat advanced. Uh, uh, certainly a beginner can learn a lot from it, but uh, it's uh, uh, over some people's heads. And I know certainly much of it is over my head. So uh, something to think about, look at, and try to understand. <clears throat> uh, why is workspace organization important? First of all, uh, DSP um, uh, is, can be quite simple, but it can get rather complicated. So an organized workspace and flow graph, which I'll demonstrate in a minute, promotes an understanding of signal processing logic. So if, if you're content to just to thrash around in the dark and uh, maybe something will work or maybe something won't work, well then don't bother to get organized. But if you are interested in understanding and pursuing DSP logic to any depth, then uh, this is, uh, you have to be organized. Um, organization makes the flow graph modifications easier. And I say modifications, basically, uh, you're gonna make mistakes. You're gonna wanna do little experiments. You're gonna wanna change parameters. And if you have that organized, you can easily and quickly do that and, and be satisfied with the result. Uh, uh, organized workspace facilitates troubleshooting and problem solving. And believe me, there'll be plenty of uh, troubles to shoot and problems to solve when you're working with GNU radio, and uh, especially when you hook it to a real radio and get on the air. And it reduces the risk of workspace mistakes. It may, may sound sort of silly and redundant, but no, uh, workspace uh, mistakes are quite common. And when I say workspace, I probably should define that. That's the, the center section 
where you place your photograph <clears throat> and connect the blocks. Uh, mistakes are very easy to make and very frustrating. And you know, I guess I should say rather discouraging. You know, you've spent time, you don't have a lot of time to spend. You spend an hour or two hours working on your flow graph and suddenly there's a catastrophic mistake and you want to just throw your hands up and quit. Well, if you can reduce those episodes, you're more likely to be successful and happy about what you're doing. Here's an example of workspace orientation and it's like the proverbial seeing the, the, the forest through the trees. The blocks that you can't read and barely see there are the trees. The forest is this screen in front of you. And what I mean here is this is an example of workspace organization. Here are my control box, the, uh, the uh, GUIs, the GUI control box up here of FFTE and switches and sliders and things. Here are the variables that uh, I use within the flow graph. Uh, next down is the receiver section uh, for a single sideband receiver. Next down is a um, uh, filter, a uh, single sideband filter module, complex uh, filter module. Same thing, transmitter, complex filter module for the transmitter. Notice a few things. Uh, I have uh, note blocks, which I'll talk about, where you document what you're doing and kind of remember what you did and helps you uh, keep self-organized the, the day after or the week after you did something. Um, and you notice here too, uh, these little dead end blocks. These are virtual uh, sources and sinks. Now I, I realize I'm jumping rather quickly here, but this is a way to connect this spot right here where my pointer is with this spot down here without drawing a big crisscross line through your flow graph, confusing line. There are uh, virtual audio cables, virtual data cables within the uh, computer system. Um, oh, um, you notice a lot of these blocks are rotated. Uh, this is an example. This keeps the number of lines from crisscrossing and orients things in a nice orderly manner. So block rotation, notes, uh, virtual uh, sources and sinks, and a vertical uh, stratification of your flow graph aids in workspace organization in, in a graphical computing technique. Uh, we're gonna hit some of the flow graph details. Um, the first is the options or top block, and that is this block. Barry, do you wanna say something? Uh, since you're mentioning note blocks, in addition to using a, a note block itself, I was going to add a comment about the note blocks. In addition to using note block itself, you can uh, you can add uh, notations to any block. If you go to the properties advanced tab, and there's a field for comments. Now, for those to actually show up on the flow graph, you have to go to your view options and and uh, enable uh, showing those uh, notations. It's not always default on, but once you turn it on, then you can have all these nice uh, notations show up on what each block does if you've gone to the trouble of doing it. <laughs> Go ahead, John. So there are uh, alternatives to the note blocks that vary outline, and uh, I included them because they're just simple uh, and not complex and put them on your screen, and, but there are more sophisticated and probably more adequate ways of notating what you're doing as very outlined. Block rotation is something you should consider, again, in the goal of being organized, uh, being able to understand what you're doing, and it just keeps the extraneous lines and things off the screen. There are the virtual sources and sinks, which I pointed out. Uh, there's, uh, we're gonna talk about sample rate logic and game distribution, mostly sample rate logic, and nested Python commands to control multiple functions. Okay, here's the top block that uh, we were talking about. Uh, over here where, where my pointer is, this is what shows up on your workspace in the corner. And then when you open it up, this is what's inside. Uh, it, this uh, labels the uh, Python script uh, with a, a title or in, a, in a file. This is the actual title you will see printed on your screen, uh, HF sideband transceiver. This is uh, attribution. 
and a little bit of a timestamp. There's other ways to do timestamping, but here, this is, I guess, something I did uh, a month ago. And uh, this is what I did to modify this uh, flow graph. I uh, changed the uh, receiver filter skirts. <clears throat> note blocks, keep track of your thinking. Here's a note, uh, receiver section. And this is the inside of this note block. You click it and inside and it says receiver section. It could also say, keep drive level below X value or, or some other uh, bit of information. Block rotation. When you uh, right click on a block, you will get a, a menu. Uh, and amongst them is block rotation, clockwise or counterclockwise. Uh, you can rotate a block uh, at 90 degree increments. For instance, this audio sync should be out this way, but I rotated it 180 degrees, brought it over here and had a short stub of a, uh, of a data link here. This one's, I just arbitrarily did it at, at 90 degrees. I don't know why, just to show the potential of the uh, block rotation. These simplify the flow graph appearance and make it easier to problem solve, et cetera. Um, here's the notes again. Uh, this is an example of a receiver single sideband filter right here. Uh, proper, this is a, and then here is a virtual sinks and virtual sources. <clears throat> In this uh, slide here, you can see the commands here. This is the, uh, the virtual sync is receiver in and the virtual source should be receiver in. And for some dumb reason, I put receiver out. But these two stream IDs should be identical. And these replace lines on a flow graph. Sample rate logic and gain distribution. Um, I'm gonna emphasize sample rate logic, actually. This is a uh, simplified um, uh, flow graph of a FM, a narrowband FM receiver. This could work on two meters or 432 or any band, actually. Um, here is the uh, USRP uh, receiver source that downloads or that converts the RF to uh, the uh, baseband. This is a uh, baseband tuning filter. This is a squelch. This is the NBFM, narrowband FM demodulator, uh, FM de-emphasis just to get the audio uh, distribution correct and a low pass filter to limit the uh, audio band pass to three kilohertz, a, multi a volume control and an audio sync. Now, what I wanna point out here is a good example of block rotation. All these blocks could have extended off to the right with this cur cursor is going off to infinity. Instead, I just rotated them and tucked them underneath. I chose as my uh, foundational sample rate, the uh, audio sync sample rate here, it's 48 kilohertz. Multiply that by, say, 8, some factor 8, 10, some other number. Plug that in as my sample rate for the whole system. So it's a simple decimation of 8, gets us down to 48, 48 continues and all. And the reason you do that is that you don't end up with problems of, of underruns or overruns with your sources and sinks. So if you start from the basic, uh, sync sample rate and multiply up in a receiver to your uh, uh, basic sample rate and you got that. Now you could have used 44.1 or even 32. Now 32 is just perfect because uh, you tend to want to get a uh, sample rate that is basically 10 times the uh, uh, data rate of your, let's say your audio, in this case it'd be 3000 and 10 times that is roughly 3,200, but in this case, I chose 48. Nested Python commands allows you to control multiple parameters. Now I'll show you on this block and then the next block will be in detail. Next the slide will be in detail. This is a bandpass filter uh, for a, a single sideband receiver. Uh, here are the variables that I wanna include in that filter, uh, the low frequency cutoff, 100, 380, 580, high frequency cutoff, 3.9 kilohertz, 880 kilohertz, uh, 590 kilohertz. And then the chooser, this selects the uh, 
variables to plug into this filter above. I'll show you how you do that. Um, here is the chooser, receiver bandwidth in kilohertz. This is what shows up on your, uh, your, your GUI screen, 3.9, 2.7, uh, 50 cycles. And these are the choices. Here is the bandcast filter itself. Yeah, and this is an example of the nested commands. Uh, the sample rate, as I said, is uh, uh, one eighth of the sample rate for the receiver. Here is the, uh, uh, the way to control the nested commands of a low frequency cutoff. This in the brackets, these two brackets on the end, is the whole command. The bandpass filter low variable is controlled, um, or parentheses, controlled by the um, uh, chooser in the brackets, uh, square brackets, variable bandwidth, high frequency, and pass frequency high, again, controlled by the <clears throat> chooser in the brackets, variable bandwidth. There happens to be another uh, control in here, which I'm not emphasizing, it's the shape, the, the skirts of the filter. And again, there's a set of variables, uh, the receiver shape factor, uh, controlled by a, a chooser that says shape in the brackets. So let's go back a bit. So you see here where the low frequency cutoff at the, at the first selection is 100, high frequency cutoff is 3.9. And if I go all the way out to here and choose choice number three or choice number four, then you have a bandwidth of 50 cycles. Again, multiple nested Python commands control multiple parameters. Low graph problem solving. Uh, one of the common problems we all run into when we uh, start out is that sometimes our source and sinks are not in the DSP library. What's automatically included in the DSP library is the EDIS uh, UHD and the USRP support, but not necessarily on all versions of uh, GNU Radio is, uh, say, HackRF or uh, Pluto or I think they're the line SDR, some of the others. So I'll show you how to deal with that. Uh, how to can, how to interpret console data. And the console is the printout on the left side of the screen underneath the workspace. And it gives useful data as to how your system is working. There are version problems and subversion problems. A version problem would be uh, 3.7 GRC versus 3.8 GRC, for instance. But a subversion problem would be a a version within, say, 3.7 or a version within 3.8. Talk a little bit about signal tracing and using a, a, a DSP block called a fractional resampler to get rid of AU and AU interruptions in your flow graph. We'll talk about that in a minute. The bypass block option when you're troubleshooting and the undo button in the taskbar, very important. Okay, if your source and sync drivers are not in the DSP library, well, what do I do? It's real simple to download and install the driver in your hardware. I've, these uh, links are all pretty dynamic. You know, they, they change over time. So uh, when I did this, these are what appeared to be current in December of uh, 2020. Uh, for Pluto SDR, you can follow this link and uh, figure out how to load uh, Pluto SDR source and sync into your um, flow graph, or into your, uh, I said flow graph, I meant DSP library. Lime SDR, same thing, and the hack RF, the same thing. There may be more current uh, links, but uh, these are the ones that were current at the time I made the slide. The console is that printout in the lower left-hand corner, right underneath the workspace. It shows the GRC version and other errors, and I'll point that out. I'll step through this a little bit. It's kind of interesting. If you ever wanted to know what exact uh, GNU Radio Companion version you're using, right at the top is the uh, is its name, 3.7.13.4. That's the one I'm using. It has the block path, USR, local, share, GNU Radio, GRC blocks. Um, <clears throat> then it shows a little further down here. It's executing 
the uh, from the uh, top block of the multi-mode HF VHF transceiver. Um, it shows here I'm opening it with a uh, USRP2 uh, network uh, uh, Edis box, the frame size and things. Um, since it's on the uh, um, on internet uh, on the uh, uh, Ethernet, I was unable to set the thread priority, and I didn't bother with it. Um, now here's might be very useful. The UHD warning, this makes reference to the uh, 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 sync and source. They do not support the record requested receiver sample rate. I built in my thing uh, eight times, uh, my flow graph, eight times uh, 48 uh, kilohertz. Well, that comes out to 38, 400, 4,000. Where the actual sample rate, for some reason, it's generating this different number. So what I actually, I'll show you next. What I did was I uh, changed my sample rate to this number and it cleared up this uh, warning. Um, shows here that some of my blocks in my file uh, flow graph have been deprecated and uh, that still works. And this is the corrected uh, console data. The same uh, USRP. Same can't set the thread priority. What is absent is the uh, sample rate error and the same business about the blocks being deprecated and the IQ balance. So uh, by correcting the sample rate, I uh, got rid of some problems in both in the uh, council and in the actual output of the uh, program. I mentioned that there are uh, problems with uh, version problems and subversion problems. Let's talk about the version problems first. Um, you're probably, if you dig it all deep into this, you'll find out there's been a change here in the last year from 3.7 and its subversions to 3.8 and its subsequent subversions. A lot of the legacy flow graphs that have been published on the internet, and you'll find on my website and other places, simply will not run if you've installed version 3.8 in your computer. What you get is a blank workspace. So this presents you with a little bit of a choice here. You know, when you uh, install the new radio in your computer, do you install version 3.7 and take advantage of the accumulated uh, flow graphs and experience over the last five years or so? Or do you load version 3.8 and start afresh with some of the new tutorials, such as the work that uh, Barry has done on the new uh, wiki? Version 3.8 flow graphs also will not run on version 3.7. They're simply missing blocks. And this is uh, what I've done with some of Barry's tutorials. Uh, what you see is uh, some blocks like this NBFM transmit block come through, but other blocks like the multiply, the volume control, uh, fractional resampler, uh, another volume control are uh, have to. Uh, Substitute. So the solution for running 3.8 flow graphs on a 3.7 GRC installation is to hand build the flow graph block by block, parameter by parameter from your DSP library. It's not a copy and paste solution. You have to get in there and move the box around and re enter the parameters, uh, but uh, it'll work. <clears throat> So there's uh, backward compatibility to a degree with a little bit of effort from 3.8 to 3.7, but uh, no way that I know of going from 3.7 to 3.8. Subversion problems you will occasionally run into where uh, you're running a, a flow graph that was developed in version 3.7, but it was a, a subversion that uh, isn't compatible with the version you have on your computer. Well, and you'll find these missing blocks. And again, it's the same problem or same solution. Simply replace the missing blocks with blocks from your DSP library, and then it'll work. I think this is less of a problem now than it used to be. But there is one other problem here with subversion problems. And this is an example from the um, console that I mentioned that comes up on your screen. You put a flow graph uh, in your workspace, you uh, 
get a green arrow and says, boy, you're ready to go. You click that green arrow and it starts giving the version number and the clock rates and uh, uh, those sorts of things. And it's just going down. It looks great, looks great. And suddenly you hit this and the flow graph will not run. Well, what is the issue here is likely, in my experience, is like they're trying to find, oh, here it is, <clears throat> USRP source. Often um, there is something about the uh, driver for the USRP or your hack RF or whatever you're running, but uh, that is incompatible. So what I suggest when you get an error like this, rather than throwing your hands in despair or cursing the author, is to simply replace the source and sync blocks first from your library. Other, and then if that is not sufficient, then basically hand build uh, the flow graph from your DSP library. Signal tracing and stimulus response testing. Um, sometimes you'll be developing or, or working with a flow graph and you know, you're not hearing anything say through the speaker, uh, but it's, it's otherwise seems to be working. What's the problem? Well, what you can do is uh, take an FFT um, GUI uh, display and uh, instrumentation widget like that FFT display here, and study the data stream frequency components. Uh, click it, uh, create a, a data arrow to the output of your receiver, and see if you get uh, visible output, and then to the output of the uh, FFT. Uh, uh, somewhere else down the line, like it's the output of the squelch or the output of the filter, et cetera. So you can look at the data stream frequency components and find out what's going on, where the, the data stream stopped or where it didn't stop. That will help you. Stimulus response testing is kind of a fun thing to do. Uh, for instance, if you have a low pass filter and you want to look at the uh, frequency distribution characteristics, well, how do you do it? Well, one good way is to use a noise source. Uh, either signal source or I'm promoting a noise source, which is a broadband source of uh, uh, data. Put it through your low pass filter. You look at your uh, uh, GUI uh, frequency sync, and what you see is a nice outline of the filter. It'll show the low frequency cutoff and the high frequency cutoff. This is uh, not so much a uh, signal tracing technique, but as a uh, stimulus response testing that can be applied to any block if that is frequency dependent, noise source and a FFT frequency sync display. <clears throat> the real killers uh, is when you install a uh, flow graph and you get at the bottom of the screen this rapid fire machine gun of used and AU interruptions. And what's wrong? Well, it's a, a sample rate in a compatibility. And the AU is a, a giveaway. It's the audio sync. If you have an audio sync in your flow graph, you'll get those interruptions. One the fundamental way to fix it is to align the uh, sample rates of the uh, sync with the sample rate of the flow graph. And that's where I came up with the suggestion that you use a simple decimation of the uh, multiple of your sync audio rate, say if it's 48K or 44.1K or 32K, then your sample rate should be a factor six, eight, and something uh, in, in, integer multiple of that. Um, <clears throat> so Marcus Mueller wants to be admitted um, of that factor. If, however, that fails, and sometimes it does fail, you can use a fractional resampler. So here I'm coming out of the audio stream. This is my volume control. I uh, do a complex uh, uh, to, uh, reel. This is a fractional resampler, and this goes into my audio. So the fractional resampler, I'm lab uh, the GUI, I'm labeling as ratio. And the uh, parameters for that uh, slider here are, uh, it's controlled by ratio. And uh, at the default value of one, which is no resampling, then the minimum of 0.98 or maximum of 1.1. Then what I do is I slide the uh, GUI uh, widget right and left, up and down until the U's go away. And then I uh, memorialize that 
later on in the flow graph. But the point of it is you can control the uh, data flow to your sink by using your fractional resampler to correct for A and AU interruptions. Again, it's troubleshooting uh, the bypass block option. Let's say you've uh, troubleshooted with your FFT sink and for some crazy reason, uh, the data stops flowing through your AGC. I just made that up. There's no, no data here where the arrow is, but you got data here. Well, what you can do then is bypass the block. When you uh, right click on this uh, block here, there's the option, many of the blocks, not all the blocks, many of the blocks to bypass. Select bypass and the block turns yellow. And then hopefully the data will continue through that block onto the next stage in the flow graph. Again, a useful problem solving technique. The undo button is a useful problem solving technique. Uh, it's an easy way to undo workspace mistakes. And workspace mistakes are especially common with congested flow graphs and when using computers with touchpads and small screens. It's just virtually impossible to uh, keep the pointer aligned on a specific uh, data link or on a specific box sometimes. So here's just an example uh, of the undo button up on the uh, uh, ribbon on the top. I circled it with my shaky red line here. <clears throat> here, for some reason, here's my USB source. Here's my uh, frequency translating for uh, FFT filter. And for some reason or other, this data link is missing. The flow graph wouldn't run. So why didn't it happen? Well, I must have clicked it. I didn't know. So I could, um, I could put, click here and click there and put the, the line in. Or I could hit this button and go back and find that link back in there. The uh, undo button is a, is a stacked register. So let's say you made a fatal error, uh, but that was uh, five commands previously, and you just have, have your hands in your head wondering, oh my God, how do I undo all this? And how much rebuilding do I have to do? Well, all you have to do is keep clicking the undo button. Go back five spaces, six spaces, how many necessary spaces until you get the fatal error fixed, and then you can go on and work with your flow graph. <clears throat> Um, you know, Barry, maybe I should pause. Uh, and if you wanted to come in and make some comments, I, I realize I've been rattling on pretty quickly here. Uh, any suggestions from you? Um, you're doing fine. Uh, I've been watching the uh, group chat <clears throat> column there and added a few comments of my own, but uh, everything's moving right along. You're, you're at 45 minutes, so uh, if you have a lot left to go, you might speed up your pace some. But other than that, I think we're good. Go well, thank ahead. You. Well, thank you. Well, it's like a soccer match, you know, some of that interruption should be a extra time added, don't you think? And anyway, <laughs> I am at the end. I don't know how I can even talk more rapidly than I'm already doing, but I'll work at it. Left uh, here are odds and ends. Uh, eliminate the receiver DC artifact. Uh, using a selector switch, an analog transmit receive logic control, which was actually discussed at the last meeting we had, Mary, and a software method of transmit receive control with, if you're using a duplex mode with your uh, uh, hardware. How do you eliminate the DC receiver DC artifact? It's, it's really, really simple. Um, this block uh, converts the RF in here to uh, the baseband. And, uh, and with a complex output like this, you get a spike right in the center, zero frequency. And you get the upper sideband and the lower sideband. You get the um, positive frequency and the so-called negative frequency. Well, the way you get rid of that um, uh, uh, artifact right in the center of your band pass is to offset this uh, center frequency uh, by some arbitrary amount and offset this center frequency the opposite direction by an arbitrary amount. And I gave an example of 100, uh, and I'll use uh, Derek, kilohertz, kilohertz, um, 100 kilohertz. 
Uh, it could be 10 kilohertz, could be one kilohertz. The idea is to offset it to where it no longer bothers you. You can either, either hear it nor see it. <clears throat> uh, see it on your FFT display or your waterfall. So here are the property boxes. This is the source and this is the base band. Uh, here is the frequency I want, <clears throat> which excuse me, happens to be a two meter uh, calling frequency, 144.52. So I tuned the uh, USRP down 100 kilohertz, but then I compensated by tuning the FFT filter up 100 kilohertz. So what that did is I maintained the uh, frequency I was interested in listening to, but uh, threw the uh, PC uh, artifact down uh, 100 kilohertz. A selector uh, block interrupts data flow and turns off a sync. And why do I say that? Well, it's useful for hardware-derived logic for transmit receive systems. Typically, <clears throat> when the sync is accepting data and processing data, this is like your transmitter the sync. Um, the, uh, there's a LED light that comes on, a red LED light. So if you can control this selector and turn off the data, the light will toggle on or off, off when it's not processing data, presumably receiving, or on when it's processing data and presumably transmitting. So here's how you do that. Here's your selector block properties. Uh, you have a, a variable TXRX, which has a zero and, and one in it, a variable. And inside the brackets here is the chooser. And here is the chooser. Uh, chooser. Trans receive and transmit one and a zero. And by implementing that, you uh, turn this selector block on and off, turning it off, which in the receive, turning it on, which in transmit. And then you can use the LED as a logic source. And here's the logic source. Use a small amount of current from the, either the receiver or the transmit LED. And I gave the example of the transmit LED. Uh, you use that to drive, uh, uh, I use a Darlington uh, transistor switch array. The transistor then switch then controls other system switches, relays, et cetera. And then can leverage the, the relay, for instance, for uh, power amplifiers, receiver preamplifiers, antenna relays, sirens, horns, lights, et cetera. <clears throat> so basically uh, it goes back to uh, manipulating the selector switch, to in turn manipulate the LED on the sink, and then use that little bit of uh, current change to manipulate power amplifiers, preamplifiers, and antenna relays. It's the hardware method. Here's an example of uh, the, the circuit I have. Here's the uh, Darlington setup I mentioned. Um, it's just uh, this PMP. Uh, converts the uh, LED logic to uh, drive the Ar Darlington and then it goes to a relay all on five volts. Duplex mode, and I think we're nearing the end. Simple, use nested commands. And we gave example of nested commands with uh, the band, filter bandwidth selection. So in the receive mode, the receiver, the source, the center frequency is selected for the desired operating frequency. So let's say it's 144.52 megahertz. The sync center frequency, however, if has to be selected to some different frequency, so you're not hearing your transmitter running all the time. So you select the zero, which, or some other out of bounds frequency, it's rather arbitrary. I use zero. And so the, the sync is, uh, is operating, but it's not generating anything I can hear in my receiver. In the transmit mode, using a nested command, uh, you sync the center frequency to the frequency you want to transmit on, to the desired operating frequency. And the source frequency is selected to zero. Again, some other out of bounds frequency, so you're not hearing what the transmitter is doing. Duplex mode. Here's the chooser. Uh, transmit or receive. Receive or transmit. Here are the variables Rx, Tx, 1, 0, and the opposite, 0, 1. And in the source, the receiver, uh, where is that? Oh, here it is. Uh, the uh, 
receive, uh, receive frequency. And notice here it's offset 1.53 rather than uh, 5.2, just because it's, uh, the escalating filter has it offset by 100 kilohertz. So this is what it shows up. Here is this variable right here. Here is the chooser in the brackets controlling this variable. Same thing on the transmitter or sync. The transmit frequency, the variable right here and here, and then the chooser controlling that variable inside the matrix. Okay, I am done. I'm going to stop the share and give it back to you there, Mary, and thank you for helping. Get my mic turned on here. Okay, thank you very much, John. I appreciate that. And I know you covered a lot of material that uh, people wonder about and newbies wonder about all of it, I guess. In the in the chat column over there, I shared a link to the what's called the blog docs. There is a documentation page in the wiki for every block. And uh, a few are still lacking some uh, detail. I've been working on that for over a year and a half, trying to get more filled in. And uh, But you, if you have the question about a block, like uh, say something as simple as the uh, narrow band FM demodulator. You just go to the block docs, find that entry and then click on that. And the things that we try to put in there are the overall description, the parameters required, and an example flow graph. And uh, a lot of the flow graphs are very simplistic, and a lot of them are complete uh, functional uh, items like a narrow band FM receiver. And you'll probably notice my name as the author on a bunch of those. So uh, I would like to make uh, an orderly uh, method of uh, asking questions, so maybe I'll do it like uh, do it like uh, radio net control does. Is there someone with a call sign of containing a one who would like to ask a question? Uh, let's see, I think, is there a raise hand? Um, yeah, there's a hand. Okay, Mike, uh, G4CDF. Hi. Um, yeah, I, I just I, one thing I um, I found difficulty with using uh, GNU Radio Companion was to connect some um, WSJTX to the, the radio. Is there any any way that this can be done easily? Uh, I can take that question. Uh, come to my Ham Radio Expo talk uh, in about two months where I'll be showing all the connections there. But um, nobody, as far as I know, has implemented uh, any of the FT8 uh, or similar modes, JT65, in GNU Radio Companion natively. But you can certainly use GNU Radio to uh, slice out the frequency section that you're interested in, audio demod, and then pass it off to, to the other applications. Yeah, I thought I thought you could do it if you had some sort of audio wiring between computers and things, but I, I couldn't see a way of directly connecting the new radio companion to JSTX at all. You can use the Jack virtual audio interface, uh, and okay. it. you can also natively within Pulse Audio and probably Alsa, but I don't know that one. Uh, create mm. virtual loopbacks. Um, I fully admit I have occasionally taken a hard audio cable and plugged the microphone into the speaker port. Yeah, thanks very much. You can okay. do it virtually. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm working with a colleague on the Pulse Audio implementation where you can have an instance of GNU Radio and uh, uh, WSJTX on the same uh, uh, operating system and connects just fine. Mm, thank you. 
Uh, let's see. Mariana, WA7EE. Go ahead. Uh, yes, um, I'm uh, the person who, who Sean mentioned about uh, working with the uh, false audio loops uh, between WJTX and the new radio. And it's working well. Um, I don't have access to my computer now, but I could send uh, a couple of commands that I ran to create. Uh, like it's similar to a virtual cable, and you use that to connect uh, the inputs and outputs of uh, WHATX, and then uh, the inputs and outputs or, or the source and sync on your uh, the new radio block diagram, and uh, it it's working for me. So I could send some mm. some of the commands or list them in the in the chat or I, I, I don't know which way I, I can use to uh, provide some feedback, um, but it's working for me. Okay, thank you. Let's see, Andre Martins. Uh, yes, can you can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I, I just have one question concerning the block fractional fraction inter interpolator uh, as it goes as well for the resampler because it has an input parameter, uh, the phase shift. I was asking this on the, the, the chat. I don't really understand how the phase shift works because if I have a, an IQ signal and I do a, a phase shift of, a, and I do a complex to real um, transition and with the imaginary part, I get only quadrature um, components. So in theory, if I shift phase shift a quarter of a cycle, I would get just the in phase uh, component and that doesn't happen. Uh, I don't know if I'm really um, confusing how this works, but on the source code of fractional resampler, there's um, like two examples for uh, fl float signals and complex signals where you have a expected signal um, and there's the equation that you do. But um, I didn't really understand that. I, I thought you maybe have a clue on that. Thank you. Um, that might best be addressed in the uh, matrix chat room or on uh, the mailing list. Uh, a little hard to picture what you're describing <laughs> without a diagram or anything. So uh, uh, I would say for the most part, you wouldn't even use the, the phase shift, but uh, let's, let's defer that to, to chat. And while I'm talking about it, uh, I hope everyone has the link for the uh, the matrix chat room. And if you got here by uh, by that link, you're there. And if not, uh, I will put it in our our chat comments here in just a second. Uh, Meanwhile, is there anyone else who wants to ask a question or, or uh, I'm, I'm looking down the list for people with raised hands. There aren't any more raised hands. Um, yeah, Barry, this is Gavin. Uh, uh, I just have a tip on that stimulus slide if you really want to see how your filter is working, go to the, the instrumentation, the FFT instrumentation, and set the number of inputs to two, and then wire both the input and the output of the filter to your instrumentation. And then you can really see what your filter is doing. Right. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, good instrumentation uh, 
blocks available, not only the, the GUIs, but if you're doing messaging there, there's a message debug. And, and of course, if you're in Python, you can always do logging or printf. <laughs> um, let's see. Derek, you want to take it a minute and I'll uh, put some stuff on, on the chat over yeah. here. Sounds great. Uh, I did post the chat link, but I didn't post the direct link to the ham radio group. So if you join the chat, you'll be jumped into the main chat channel. But then we do have some side ones, including one for amateur radio specifically. Uh, so I see a question from uh, Ralph, uh, DL5EU. Uh, there is not specifically a video input block, um, although that could be interesting. There's a lot of you know uh, video encoding questions that probably become quite difficult with that. Uh, however, if you look at the uh, D, uh, DVB, the digital video broadcast uh, examples, most of them are reading from a file source. Uh, there's various examples around, and I have a wiki page lost somewhere on my computer that I can try and dig up, where you can use other applications um, like mPlayer or VLC to read a video camera and correctly encode the video for what's expected to be transmitted. So I've used that uh, to have a uh, webcam as a source for um, like DVB S2 broadcast uh, and then out over the air with a USRP. So simple thing, no, there's no video source, but usually you can get it in either by using a FIFO file or um, uh, piping it over the network using some applications. All right. Does anyone else have questions? I have a few notes that I wrote down during John's talk that I, I can move on to if there aren't any other questions. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Um, so one thing that I, I caught, and I admit I was a little distracted by managing some of the people on the list, um, you said that there wasn't an easy way of moving from 3.7 to 3.8. Uh, and I certainly agree that there's a lot of blocks, particularly the WX blocks that have been entirely removed and so are missing. Uh, but other than that, you should be able to open up any 3.7 flow graph file, GRC file, and it will open in 3.8 or 3.9. And then you have to fix the errors such as missing uh, blocks. There's a few other small uh, changes in how Python handled things. So depending on how the flow graph was set up with parameters and stuff like that, there may be differences between Python 2 and Python 3. Um, but you should at least be able to open a file. Going from 3.8 to 3.9, the GRC uh, file format hasn't changed. And most blocks haven't changed either. So there, there may be small bits and pieces, but nothing like the WX to QT type change. One thing that I uh, found is a neat little trick. If you open a 3.7 file in 3.8, and it says missing block, and then you're wondering, well, what parameters do I need to put in the block? If you right click on it and uh, select parameters, it will show the parameters that were in that block. So you don't have to go do other research to find out what you need to put in there. So what I do is I leave the missing block on the flow graph, get the kind of block I need next to it, and then move the parameters over from, from the 3.7 to the 3.8 manually. And there are migration guides for moving from 3.7 to 3.8, 3.8 to 3.9, and eventually 3.9 to 3.10, located on the wiki, um, linked from the tutorials, I believe. Um, the other note I had here was audio buffering. Um, 
using a rational resampler to, to handle this two clock problem where you have different sample rates at the input and output is certainly uh, one way of adjusting it so that you're always supplying enough samples to the sound card that you are not under running. You, you always have enough samples in the buffer. Uh, probably the first thing to look at though is you can configure the amount of buffering available in the sound card driver. Um, and there is a small reference to that, at least on the wiki for the audio source block or the audio sync block. Um, but I'll also find a, a web link to this. And it's a small change you make in the um, GNU Radio uh, configuration file, the preferences file. It actually, having said this, it would be really good to expose this as a parameter in the sound card block. Um, so that's probably a feature we should add. But that um, can be a much more direct way of dealing with these underruns. Uh, addressing the underruns, there are two other issues. One is when you do have two hardware blocks in the same flow graph, and it's this so-called two clock problem, uh, one should be blocking and one should be non-blocking, and those are options in most of the blocks, particularly for the audio. So if you have a microphone in and a speaker out, then you've probably got problems there. And uh, so make one of them OK to block being no and the other yes. I would like to agree and interject. I didn't want to get into that. And that's pretty iterative. You just have to fiddle with blocking one or unblocking the other and you know that sort of thing and eventually work it out. I was unable to see a clear path to solving that issue. But uh, the buffers uh, are always a concern. Yes. There, there is a, a patch and I'm about to post that on. Uh, well, give me, give me a minute, do some other talking and I'll find it here. <laughs> um, the, the next note I had down there, and uh, John, I think we've, we've already started talking about this, and I saw some of your posts on the mailing list. Um, the, if you have a UA, USRP device, they actually have um, I, they actually have general purpose IO pins, and they can be set up to automatically toggle the state of those pins, depending on whether you're receiving or transmitting. There's a whole bunch of things that kind of lead into that and they're not exposed nicely in GRC right now. But for anyone who's digging in a bit deeper in the stack and writing some of your own Python, then um, just be aware that you, those are controllable and they are settable and they're described in the UHD manual. Um, and yeah, we'd love them to be better exposed in, in GRC, but they aren't at the moment. I think that actually, I can add, uh, yesterday there was a patch merged to add uh, GPIO support on the USRPs using message message passing. So uh, more things that are available <laughs> on the, the bleeding edge. Um, chats continued talking about uh, digital video broadcast. Uh, I'm definitely not the expert in, in any sort of way. I'm vaguely acquainted with it. I, I'm very interested in it. Um, Ron Economos uh, is a ham and is undeniably the expert when it comes to this and Vinny Radio, um, hands down uh, by a massive margin. <laughs> uh, but I have gotten it working. I've, I've received and transmitted DVB using Vinny Radio and a USRP um, to other hardware devices. So I've managed to match the parameters with them. I'm hoping to be able to operate the uh, Oscar 100 Eshale 2 satellite, uh, but I need a satellite dish first for that. Um, Derek, let me ask on the DVB D2. Uh, my experience is it requires quite a bit of bandwidth. Uh, oh, and uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Not, not, not every uh, hardware can support that bandwidth. So go ahead. I, in terms of sample rates, they, they were they can require up to 20 or 40 megahertz of bandwidth, but I've uh, never seen anybody run anywhere near that wide on the ham bands. 
Um, the SJL2 satellite, I think the most I've ever seen anybody run is about two megahertz. Um, so receiving the samples is not a problem at all. Uh, however, DVB, S, S2, S2X become increasingly computationally difficult, particularly as the SNR drops. So if you have a weak signal and these advanced video modes, you can be cooking a, a very modern desktop uh, trying yes. to receive them. It's, well, it's I, quite magical what they've managed to do in dedicated receivers. Well, that's good to hear. I was only thinking, uh, I thank you, uh, of uh, people with uh, uh, hardware that's run on uh, USB 2, say, uh, rather than USB 3 or Ethernet. And uh, what the bandwidth, their sample bandwidth is, is limited to three megahertz or so, I think. So uh, that's yeah. good news. I'm sh I, I always try and remember USB 2, and it's, it's considerably wider bandwidth than I ever expect it to be. Um, you can get about 10 megahertz of bandwidth over USB 2, um, yeah. <laughs> which, which, especially in the amateur radio world, gets you quite a long ways. Um, I'm still waiting for people to use 50 megahertz wide signals on some of the microwave bands. I think it's a missed opportunity. Um, and I, I don't mean to just keep chatting, but uh, Tom, so you've launched a question in, can you connect two instances of GRC via the local host? Yes, absolutely. Uh, there are both TCP and UDP source and sync blocks. Uh, however, depending on what you're doing and what the bandwidth is, the ZMQ, uh, zero message queue uh, blocks can be more reliable and they're certainly performant enough to run several megahertz of bandwidth at least, especially over localhost. And they just have some, some extra niceties if you do want to use UDP or TCP, take a look at the GRNet out of tree module. Uh, it's just more modern um, code. And I think it's been tested at much higher bandwidths, you know, 400, 500 megahertz bandwidths. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's some interest in moving those into Guinea Radio 3.10, basically updating our blocks. Um, Yeah, uh, anyone else have, have questions? Uh, everyone should be able to unmute your mics now. I think we've, uh, we no longer have problematic people in, in invading the room. Um, Yes, hi. I just wanted to I just wanted to say thank you to all. Uh, it was a very nice presentation, and I've really enjoyed it. Uh, unfortunately, I have missed the previous uh, meetings, uh, but I will uh, try to participate in the future uh, more often. <laughs> thank you very much, and, and uh, I've got to leave now. And bye bye. See you next time. Okay. Thank you, Ralph. And. Uh... All of the previous sessions have been recorded and posted on YouTube. So okay. if you go to the, the Talk Ham Radio page, those links are there. Okay, fine. And, and this, this session will be on there uh, in the near future. <laughs> okay, thanks and bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Okay, I, I did finally get the right information into the chat posting for the uh, audio related issue. And uh, what you need to do is either edit or create the uh, dot new radio folder uh, config.conf as described in that pool. And that will uh, take care of a lot of the audio buffering problems and get rid of the AUs and the and the chatter. <laughs> Barry, actually, some, that's something we should add to the uh, audio source block wiki page if it's not already on there. Uh, yes, that, that is on my notes to do. <laughs> And also, you were talking about uh, ZMQ blocks. I am just finishing a tutorial on ZMQ blocks. It's still in draft form. 
but if you like, I'll post that link on here. Uh, <laughs> Got so many tabs here. While you're pasting that, I'm going to quickly share my screen and um, put out a, a bit of an advertisement uh, for an event that folks here well may be interested in. Um, here we go. Share. I, so coming up I in the start of February, the 6th and the 7th, the free software dev room at the FOSDEM conference uh, will be running, and it's being hosted entirely online this year for the first time ever. Uh, although they always do live stream these, um, this is going to be a much more interactive event. Uh, and so this is free to attend. There's a lot of GNU Radio content, but there's also a lot of other uh, non-GNU Radio related uh, bits and pieces of talk. Uh, it tends to run uh, quite code heavy because it's the it's a software developers meetup, but there's uh, some great stuff. And uh, Daniel Estevez will be talking about his GR satellites project, which uh, is always popular. Um, Mark Lichtman will be talking about PySDR, which is a, a website that has a whole guide of getting into software defined radio and digital signal processing. Um, so there's, there's a bunch of good content there. Uh, I'll paste the link in the chat if I didn't already just do that. Okay, and then coming up next month, we have uh, Aaron Rossetto from uh, National Instruments going to talk to us about uh, Project 25 and what it, what it is and how it works. And this will be kind of heavy on the the technical details. So we're going from one end of the spectrum to the other. But it sh should be very interesting to me. I had never heard of P25 before. OK, unless uh, we have others that would like to ask questions, why don't we wrap it up and appreciate everyone attending.